Eubank started the year ranked, listen to this number, 123 in the world, and now he is what number, Nate? 30, Gail. He's number 30. He's here in New York City. He is getting ready for the next Grand Slam competition. That's the U.S. Open. It starts on Monday. So we spoke with him yesterday about his very big summer. I want to talk about the U.S. Open. We all do in just a second, but I just want to go back to Wimbledon for just a sec. Did you know how many people were talking about you? Did you know what was happening here in this country? I think fortunately I didn't, and I think that probably <laughs> helped me stay a little bit focused. Um, I had friends reaching out. Obviously, my phone went off more during that two weeks than it probably ever has. I wanted to just kind of stay in the moment, enjoy each match one at a time, and focus on that. And then afterwards, when I got a chance to kind of decompress and, and really take a deep dive in my phone and see the amount of people that reached out, yeah. I think that's when I kind of realized, oh, this was something special. And, and now as you sit here for the US Open, are you feeling pressure? <laughs> uh, honestly, feel, no. You don't look like you're feeling pressure, no, I would say. No, no, and, and I've spoken about it um, you know, in recent weeks, I've said, for about four or five years, I, I did feel pressure on myself. I felt like I wasn't um, achieving what I thought I would, and I felt like I was putting a lot of added pressure on myself. And probably over these past 12 months, I've just kind of embraced a more process mindset. So at this point in your career, you don't feel pressure, you apply it, is basically what you're saying. Yeah, that's a, fair, that's a okay. good way to look at it. I like that. All right, <laughs> so we talked about the US Open. Yeah. It's, it's right around the corner. It's here, and you don't necessarily have your opponents yet, but you know who you might be facing or who you might have to go through. Carlos Alcaraz is one of them. Daniel Medvedev, uh, Novak Djokovic. Uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a dumb question to ask, do I think you can win this? Because I know your answer is going to be damn right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what do you think it's gonna take to get through this gauntlet of talented athletes. I mean, I think that uh, you name some of those names, their men's tennis is in a really, really fun place. Um, but I, I think for me personally, I can only control what I can control. When the draw comes out, I know my first round opponent, all of my energy, just like in Wimbledon, is gonna go to the first round opponent and then we're gonna take it one match at a time. I know in my game, if I'm able to serve well, I'm a threat to beat almost anybody. Okay. And I think that in the conditions here in New York, having the home crowd behind you is gonna give me a little bit out of support. But it's always gonna just focus on me and what I can control. I can't control how well Novak is playing, how well Carlos is playing, how well Medvedev will be playing. I can control how well I prepare for it, and then we go out there and we're gonna see what happens. We were talking before no the cameras even turned on, and you knew every player, every angle, how they work, what they do, and, and you even thought uh, at one point before you turned it on, you've had this new life to your career, mm. that you might go in and become an analyst. Is that something that still fascinates you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And honestly, I think it's something that I kind of discovered a, a passion for when I decided to do it. When I kind of hit that point of frustration in 2021, I said, hey, if I'm still sitting at 200 by the end of 2022, I can look at something else because it's not nearly as fun. Yeah, 200 as a lot doesn't of the, sound so glamorous, it's, does it's, it? It's not, it's <laughs> right, not nearly. And it, yeah. the thing is, I think uh, there's so many really, really good tennis players that are ranked around 250, 300, guys that are just working to try to get there. And hungry. And hungry. And it's like you're going to tournaments and they're not nearly as glamorous. There's just little <laughs> things that after a while of dealing with it, uh. you had a point of frustration where you're saying, you know what, I'm, I might be better suited just walking away. And then that's with the initial thought of uh, jumping in the commentary, just giving it a go to see. I didn't know if I would be good at it, and immediately said this is something I really, really enjoy doing. I know, but now look at your ranking. I remember when you cracked the 100, what that meant to you. What does your ranking mean to you as you sit here today? Uh, what does it mean? It's a testament of persistence, a lot of hard work, and just pretty much just never giving up. I think that's probably the biggest thing of just saying, hey, yeah, there were some tough times, there were ups and downs, but I stuck with it, and I think now I'm kind of reaping the, the benefits of that, and I want to continue that ranking going. Whose advice what, what, has helped you the most, and whose it's met oh, the most? Because I'll question. bet a lot of people have reached out to you and said, Chris, you know what you ought to do? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. It's amazing. So many people all of a sudden have the, the answers and the, the insight when things are going well, and they want to try to offer it up to you. Um, for me, I think it's probably just those closest to me. Coco Golf is, is, is like a little sister to me. Her family is like a second family. Uh, to me, and, and one thing that she's been saying for a long time, she said, you're, you're good enough. Like, you're, you're better than you're giving yourself credit for. Did you doubt yourself? Yeah, I 100% doubted myself, and, and I think she would oftentimes say it. I would kind of dismiss it because I was like, Coco, you don't realize how good, like, I'm out here playing these guys. I know these guys a little bit better. Like, you don't <laughs> really understand. She goes, no, I practice with them too. I think you're just as good as a lot of these guys. And I think her support, her validation um, was probably one of the most meaningful because she had been telling me for years, and it's finally like, she even had to hit me with a I told you so type of moment right after Wimbledon, so I probably have to say her. You talked about it a little bit, but what is it like when you get into the zone? I like asking athletes this. Like, when you know you are in your bag, 
everything that you are doing is working. Take us inside your mind and what the game feels like. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'll say for me, there were a couple moments in Wimbledon where I kind of hit that, that, that space you're talking about. Um, and it just seems like you're reading the game well. It seems like I know where my opponent's gonna serve before he serves. It's almost like a blur. Usually, I'll have like 10 to 15 minutes of it throughout the course of a match, and then it kind of goes back down to normal. But there were some, some moments throughout Wimbledon where I held a zone for a set and a half or two mm. sets. It's just so instinctual. It's just serve comes here, return goes here. Mm -hmm. First ball here, I'm going there. And there's no thinking involved. Mm -hmm. Everything just feels very much like second nature. Gosh, when he was here, I just couldn't stop smiling because number one, he's so damn likable. Yeah, he Everywhere really he goes, he just charmed everybody when he walks and you yeah. really root for him. But Tony, there's a duality. He has that, this baby face. Yes. Oh yeah. But on the court, yeah, yeah, ferocious. He's, he's got ferocious. that swagger. He really does. We're cheering for him. Yes, we are. We are. Hope he gets hot. He could really make a run. You're right about that. 